It says in Amos 7, verses 1 to 3, God showed me that he would send swarms of locusts after the king's harvest, just as the late crops came in. And when they had stripped the land clean, in the vision that he saw, he saw that the land was just, all the, the food was gone. I cried out. I said, Lord, forgive the people. How can Jacob survive if you punish them like this? Jacob is so small. So the Lord relented and said, okay, this is not going to happen. I showed you what I was ready to do and you said, please don't do it. I'll agree with you. I'm not going to do that. But then the Lord showed him his judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and it devoured the land. So there was going to be some kind of horrible bushfire thing that was going to go right through the land and burn everything up. And once again, the prophet cried out, God, sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive if you do this to them? He's so small. And so the Lord relented and said, okay, this isn't going to happen either. So that was a wonderful thing. So here we have a prophet who could see what God's plans were and he could call out to God and say, please don't do that. And God listened to the prophet. Be pretty good if we had some more people like that around the place eh? and could sort things out. But then the Lord showed him something else. I saw the Lord standing by a wall that was built true and straight and he had a plumb line in his hand. Do you know what a plumb line is? A plumb in the old language was a piece of lead. You hang it on the end of a line, doink, and that way then the line would definitely be straight, right? You, you'd get a straight line, so you get a plumb line. And here was God, he, there was this wall that was straight and he was holding a plumb line in his hand so you could measure what was straight and what was crooked. And the Lord said to him, Amos, what can you see? He said, well, I can see a plumb line. And then the Lord said, I set a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. So God had said, I'm going to send this swarm of locusts. He said, well, please spare them. And God said, okay, I'll spare them that one. And then God showed him, I'm going to send the fire. And he said, oh, please spare them. He said, okay, I won't do that one. But this time he said, I will no longer spare them. You know, as a parent, you put up with some things your child does. And the first time it frustrates you and you get cranky and you'll get annoyed, but you, you don't take it any further. Then they do it again. And then there comes a point when you take action. When you, okay, let's sort this out. Who's making all this? Noise? Who's doing that? What, who made that mess? And you step in and you take action. Well, God was saying, I've come to the point where I'm going to step in and I'm going to take action. And so he says, um, he said that I'm going to use this plumb line which shows what is straight and what is true and I'm going to measure everybody. And if you're crooked and I'm measuring you against my straight line, I'm going to judge you for how crooked you are. I'm going to test you against a standard whether you are straight and whether you are not, whether you are going to be true or not. Now, when he gave that prophecy, there were people in the land of Israel who were pretty upset, including a priest called Amaziah. And Amaziah the priest told Amos, get out of here, you prophet. Go back to the land of Judah. You might recall that at some point the land of Israel was broken into two different kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the one that was called Israel. And Amos had actually come from Judah and had gone to Israel and he was prophesying doom upon the people. He said, you go back to Judah, earn your bread there, do your prophesying back where you came from. Don't prophesy any more in Bethel here in Israel because this is the king's sanctuary and it's the temple of the Israelite kingdom. Get out of here. Stop doing what you're doing. I want you to hear what Amos said in reply. Amos answered, I was never a prophet. I wasn't even the son of a prophet. I was a shepherd. I also went out and looked after the fruit trees, the sycamore fig trees. I was just a gardener. I was looking after plants and animals. But the Lord took me from looking after the flock and he said to me, go and prophesy to my people Israel. Like, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I didn't sign up for this job. I didn't say to God, please make me a prophet. I was happy with what I was doing. But God grabbed me and he took me and he put me in this place where I don't really want to be. And he's told me what to say, which you don't want to hear. What am I supposed to do about that? Right? Amos was called. He didn't even necessarily want the call, but he was called and he had no alternative 
but to respond to the call. You know, in Israel, they had different ways of calling people. If there was an enemy coming, uh, they would have to call people to battle and they would use trumpets or, or shofars. I asked Bill if he'd bring along a shofar, but he didn't have one. So he could blow one in the church today. And it, that was the sort of sound that would go out across the hillside. Oh, grab your weapons. Run. We've got to go to war. We, we're being called. We are being called. At the same time, God calls people too. And they may not be looking for it. They may not be wanting it. They might be quite happy to look after the sheep and pick the fruit on the trees and not have to do something difficult. But when God calls, God calls. We like to be in control of our lives. Well, I do. Anyone else? We like to be in control of our lives. We like to do what we think is right. But God is in control. And he has the right to call us to do his will. And we will be judged on how we do what God wants. What are the two most important things God tells us to do? The two greatest commandments? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So we'll actually be judged. We are actually called, every single one of us is called to do those things. And when you stand before God and God says, well, how did you go loving me? Oh, I didn't think it was important. Didn't you hear my call? Oh, what about, how'd you go looking after your neighbor? Well, those neighbors, they were really annoying. Oh, no, I threw a firebomb into their house. No, I didn't want to care about them. And God says, didn't you hear my call? I called you to do these things. We'll be judged based on the call that God is giving to us. So I now want to take you to the writings of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the church a group of people in a city called Colossae. And he wrote to them because his friend, one of the people in his team called Epaphras or Epaphroditus, had actually gone off on a mission trip, maybe taken a few other people with him, and went to this town where Paul had never been and preached the same gospel that Paul preached and people became Christians and they grouped together and they formed a church. And when the word came back to Paul and Timothy, hey, Epaphras has got this great church going up here in Colossae, Paul and Timothy were really thrilled. that This is great. This is what we want to see happening. And so Paul began to pray, Paul and Timothy, every single day they prayed for those people whom they'd never met in that place called Colossae. And we have it written in the book in the Bible called Colossians because Paul wrote a letter to these people that are called the Colossians. And this is what he wrote. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. That's a nice greeting. Then he goes on and says, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all God's people. Faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. And then he goes on and says, You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. I mentioned in a message some weeks ago, that Paul is often in his letters recorded what it is that he prays for people and that sometimes some of the most beautiful insights you can have is to look at what Paul was praying. And here is his prayer for the people in Colossae. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. One of the Bible songs I used to love singing many, many years ago, I haven't heard it for a long time, talked about this verse. He brought me out of the kingdom of darkness and into his glorious light, singing about that God actually rescued us out of darkness into God's kingdom. 
you know what it is to be in darkness? You meet people who are down the street and their whole world is doom and gloom. And when you try and show some kindness and show some hope, oh no, there is no hope. It's not going anywhere. No, no nothing's going to get any better. And I don't think no matter how hard I try, no, excuse me, are you listening to me? Like they're, they're in the dark. When they try to light a candle, it just won't light. When they turn their torch on, the batteries are flat. They're in the dark. They're stuck there. They cannot see. And here, the Bible says that we were grabbed out of that kingdom of darkness and put in the kingdom of light. And suddenly you think, oh, wow, that makes sense. Wow, that's what's going on. Oh, that's who I am. Oh, that's why I shouldn't do that. Ah, and suddenly the lights come on. We've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light the kingdom of God's dear son. So there's a change of kingdom that happens, and that's what happened to these people in Colossae. Now, I want you to see then, by thinking about Amos way back in the Old Testament and the Christians in Colossae, that God is calling all men everywhere to repent and to turn from their selfish worldly ways in the kingdom of darkness to serve God. Some will have a special voice like Amos, I'm calling you to go to those people and say these things. But all of us are called to live in God's kingdom, to live in the light, to live in the truth, to live in the reality that God has brought us into. And so, I wonder if you just might close your eyes for a moment and listen. Can you hear a trumpet? Can you hear a trumpet? You probably can't. <laughs> Can you hear a trumpet? God is actually calling you. There, there is a sense in, for all of you, whether you hear the trumpet or not, God is actually calling you. I was preaching in a church in a school hall years ago, and there was a, a, a man and a lady that came to the church who had very little church background. Um, the only reason they wanted to come to the church where I was is because they'd seen me on television, and they wanted to see someone who'd been on television. So that was really impressive, okay? But they were hungry to know more about God, and one particular Sunday, they came back over a quite a long period of time, one particular Sunday after the service, the woman came to me and she said, why do angels blow trumpets? And I thought, I don't know. It's not a question I get asked every day. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> and when was the last time you thought about angels blowing trumpets? And I thought, I said, I, I, uh, well, I suppose maybe it's to sort of signal that there's a celebration or maybe, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. I said, why do you ask? She said, because I could see the angels blowing trumpets. I said, you could see the angels blowing trumpets. I said, where did you see them? She said, you were standing at the front and you were talking and you were sharing the message. And as you shared the message, I saw um, angels walk out that way and angels walk out that way in white and they were holding long golden trumpets and they were blowing the trumpets as you were preaching. I thought, wow, I wish I could have seen that. That would have been really quite amazing, right? I thought, well, what does that mean? You see, trumpets were used to call people, a call to worship. Even when they were in, the, in the, the wilderness and they had the tabernacle, they had a certain call that went, and it meant only the leaders came. And then only the leaders came. And if it was for others to come, some other different kind of signal was made, and a different group of people came. They got to know their call. They got to know the call that was on them. God is blowing his trumpets over you today. Some of you, he's saying, I want to call you into the light. Some he's saying, I want to call you to go and be a voice where they don't even want to hear you. For some it will be, I want to call you to a new place. God calls people and today God is calling each of you into something. Some of you will say, yes, God's been speaking to me all week about doing something really different and really difficult and something I really don't even want to discuss because it just feels scary. I don't even know that I can do that sort of thing. I want you to recognize God is calling you. He's blowing his holy trumpet over your life. Listen to the call of God. Look at the things that Paul said when he, he said to the uh, the people in Colossae, I'm praying for you. And he was saying, you've been called out of darkness into this thing. Look at the things he was praying about and see them as what we are called into. We are called to life 
in Christ, to into Jesus and God's kingdom. We are called to have love for all of God's people. Oh dear, that can be difficult. Mm. My father used to say that in churches, there are people that God sometimes allows to come. One of them is called Sister Blister. And she's always complaining about something and she's always touchy that you've hurt her, you've trod on her toe or something, brother, you know? Sister Blister. And then there's another one called Brother Bluster, who's always in your face and, and, and saying something that offends you. So to love all of the, God's people, well, that's what Paul prayed for those people, that they would love all of God's people. He talked about hope in heaven's blessings. You know, the enemy likes to discourage us. And so he's, there's this saying that people have, oh, you're not just expecting pie in the sky when you die, are you? And they make it sound like how, how wrong of you to be thinking about heaven and, and pavements of gold and a heavenly mansion for you. Like, well, the, hey, what's wrong with that? Paul was saying that's the hope that's going to carry you through. Rejoice in that hope. We are going to a much, much better place, much, much better circumstances. We're going into the blessing of God for eternity. We have hope in God's blessings, and that often helps us press through in the difficult circumstances. Imagine a person who said, I've given away everything I own and everything I've learned, all the job that I have and all the hopes and plans I have, and I'm going to some horrible place where I may only last for a few years because it's such a difficult place. It's so full of disease, and I'm going there to tell people about Jesus. And you would say, why would you do that? I said, because what's waiting for me is so much better than anything here on this earth. What am I giving up? Oh, you're giving up Western society and, and fast food. You say, I don't need those things. They're only temporary. I want to do something that's eternal. That's a completely radically different way of looking at the whole world. And so when we have a hope of heaven's blessings, we look at this world differently. The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He was also praying that they would have knowledge of God's will to actually know, God, what's your will for me? What do you want? I really want to have a real understanding of what you want me to do and how you want me to do it. The knowledge of God's will through wisdom and understanding that is given by the Spirit. Spirit of God giving you wisdom. The Spirit of God giving you understanding. I understand why I should do that. I understand why I should do that. Life worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him. And rescue from darkness. And he talks too about redemption by the forgiveness of sins. Friends, it's a, it's a, it can be difficult for people who have been to church too often, who have heard about Jesus died for your sins. He died on the cross. Jesus shed his blood. And if you put your faith in Jesus, you get to go to heaven. And people can hear that often enough to kind of feel like it sounds like Mary had a little lamb. It's just another one of those things they keep hearing all the time. I want you to understand this. You have been sold out to sin and the devil and you have to be bought back. And you can't do it yourself. Jesus had to shed his blood on the cross so that he then had the power to rescue you, to redeem you, redemption, redeem you, get you back and to forgive your sins. It has to happen. It's a transaction. There is nothing else. You can't go to university and get something better or different. You can't spend $20 billion and get anything as powerful as redemption by the forgiveness of sin. And you were called to that. But there are people who say, oh, well, I, I, I'm not interested in religion. I really would like to be able to own my fancy sports car one day. So I'm sorry, you've got your attention on the wrong things. God can bless you and you can have your sports car, but you've got to have redemption by the forgiveness of sins. You've got to. That's what you're called to. That's what the trumpet is. There was uh, someone wrote a book or a story or something years and years ago. And they talked about the hound of heaven. I guess they were thinking about the huntsman going out and, and they have their big dogs, the hound, <laughs> that bounds along. And it just keeps chasing after the rabbit. And the man and his horse rides along after the, after the hound. And the hound, <laughs> And they'll follow the hounds, follow the hounds, and we'll catch the fox. And the hound, no matter where the fox goes or the rabbit goes or the deer goes, the hound is <laughs> still bounding after them. And this person wrote this story and said, there is a hound that was sent from heaven. 
the hound of heaven, and it's going to keep chasing you and saying, you've got to give in and give your life to Jesus. You've got to give in and give your life to Jesus. Oh, run, climb a tree. You've got to get in and give in and give your life to Jesus. Oh, I'm going to go to some other place. And then <laughs> here's the hound of heaven bounding along, following you, saying, I don't care where you go. I want you to keep hearing this message. You need to get right with God through faith in Jesus. Everything else in the world is actually so insignificant when you compare it to the wonder of the transformation that we have. And what that does, it doesn't only bless this life, it opens up all of that eternal blessing as well. We are called to that. There's a trumpet call going out. <laughs> Calling out to us. Get right with God. Be the person God wants you to be. Go where God wants you to go. Be the one who God is calling. Be the one and step into the life God has, has for you. You know, you can be a self-made man, a self-made person who does things the way you want and you can build the best and biggest thing you ever want. Or you could let God, who is the true owner and architect of your life, say, hey, why don't we just bulldoze that little shack that you've built, that little humpy, and what if we build a mansion on this site? What if we do something entirely different? God is calling us, calling us. And for some people, that call is to go and do something really unusual. I've told this before, but years ago, Susan and I went to a church we'd never been to before, only ever went there the one time. And there was a, a young man that was being called out the front. To God had been calling his spirit, calling him over time to do something really difficult. He was a tradie. I think he might have been an electrician or something. He was just a tradie. He was only in his late 20s, had a wife and a child, and... He felt God was calling him to something and he'd talked to the pastors about it and, and they'd prayed about it and the call wouldn't go away. He knew he had to do this thing. And so he sort of finally made the plans and his church was praying for him and saying, we release you now to go out and do what God is calling you to do. And so we got to chat to him over a cup of coffee and who are you? Well, and, and he hadn't been to Bible college. He hadn't done all that religious stuff. He was a tradie, but he loved God and he knew God was calling him. I said, what, what, are you, what are you actually going to do? He said, I want to rescue young girls from the sex trade in Thailand. Well, have you ever done it before? No. Do you know what to do? No. He said, I just believe God's telling me to do it. And so we were privileged to be there and met this man on the day that he was actually being commissioned to go and do that. It must have been 10 years later that I discovered and heard about the ministry called Destiny Rescue. Destiny Rescue is now operating in, in multiple countries. They have rescued thousands of girls out of sex trade trafficking in Asia. Started by a tradie who'd never been to Bible college, who just felt God kept pulling at him. God kept pulling at him. I was there when Destiny Rescue was born. <laughs> And this guy didn't know how it was going to work or what was going to happen, but he followed the call. Da -da! There's a call on your life. God is calling you to better and more wonderful things. Certainly, first, to put your faith in Jesus, then to actually obey God and to be ready to do what he wants you to do and to go where he wants you to go. Like Amos, ending up in Israel with a whole lot of people that said, please go away. But he said, I can't. I'm under orders. I was called to come here and do this. I want to let you know, God can do wonderful and amazing things in and through you if you'll just respond to the call. If you'll just respond to the voice of God as he calls you. Calls you and sends you and takes you into amazing and wonderful things. So let's pray about that now. Father, I thank you that you have people's lives under control and you have amazing plans for them. But they can often be stubborn or independent or blind. They can be in such darkness that they cannot see the flicker of light even when it flickers. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I break the power of darkness off people's hearts and minds. I break the power of conformity to natural ideas off people's minds. I release upon them ears to hear the trumpet call of Almighty God. I release upon them ears to hear. And I now release the blowing of the God's shofar, God's trumpets, God's, the angels blowing their golden trumpets. I release the call of God across this room 
through these lives, young and old, to the people who would listen to or watch this message, I release the call of God in Jesus' name, that there would be a gripping in their spirit as God picks them up and takes them where he wants them to go to do what he wants them to do. I release the call of God. And for those that have had the call of God upon them for years and have not done anything about it, to recognize this is the call of God and to respond to it. Amen. Friends, this is not the end of my message. I want to quickly say something else. There was a prophet man, a man who traveled from place to place and did conferences and talked about godly prophetic things. He'd finished a conference. He was sitting in an airplane and he was flying back to his hometown, wherever it was in America. And as he was leaning against his seat, trying to get a bit of sleep, God spoke to him and said, talk to the man across the aisle in the other chair. He didn't even open his eyes. He said, God, whoever it is, I don't care. I've prayed for so many people this weekend. I'm tired. I don't need to talk to one more. And he felt God was calling him, calling him, calling him. to Talk to the man across the aisle. So he finally opened his eyes and looked across, and there was this big, fat, tattooed dude, this really, really, uh, the sort of guy you don't want to meet in a dark alley, sitting in that other chair across the aisle. And he thought, no, I think I'll go back to sleep, God. And God says, no, you've got to talk to this man. He said, what am I supposed to tell him? He said, I want you to tell him that he's a wimp. Excuse me. You want me to talk to the really tough guy and tell him that he's a bit of a wimp, that he's... He said, yep, that's what I want you to tell him. He said, no, I'll go back to sleep. And God just kept pulling at him. No, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. So <clears throat> he said, excuse me, mate. And the, the guy said, yep. Yeah. He said, I've got a message for you from God. Oh, yeah? What is it? You're a wimp. Because <laughs> This is, I don't know how many thousand feet there would have been, but up in the air, there's nowhere to go, right? There's nowhere to go. And the guy looked across him and said, yeah, and what else? What? He said, you act and look tough on the inside, you're a pussycat. Yeah, and what else? God's been watching you and God wants to claim you for his purposes. Yeah? That girl you're living with, you've got to marry her. Uh-huh. And that band that you're in, he was a bass player or a drummer or something in a rock band that went around America. That band that you're in is going to disband in nine months' time. Oh, yeah? And he said, and God wants you to start an orphanage. You know what the man said? Yeah, I've always wanted to do that. Ever since I was a child, I've had, I've had, what has he had? What has he had all those years? The call of God upon his life. And now he was famous, he had money, he had tattoos, he had reputation, he had all this stuff, but he was not fulfilling the call of God. And this prophet guy felt God talking to him, challenged the man, followed up with him, he said God was wonderful. The band did this band, the guy did get married, he was there at the, the, the wedding. All that stuff happened and the guy went on to start his orphanage. The call of God on your life might be something you've often thought about when you were a kid. It's just pulled at your heart. Oh, if you know, if ever I had the money, if ever I could, one day I'd love to. You may be surprised that there are a call of God has been on your life, and you, when it actually comes clear to you, say, "Yeah, yeah, 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 I know that one. Yes, I've always had that. In different times, I've felt that." Right? I want you. When I say I want you to listen to and respond to the call of God. I'm talking seriously about God being able to completely turn your life around. But first, have you put your hand, your life in God's hands? Have you said, God, I've heard the religious stuff often enough, but now I need to make it real. I need Jesus as my Savior. I give in. The hound keeps chasing me. I'm going to let myself get caught. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus. That's your first step. And as you do that, heaven begins to open. The Spirit of God comes into your life and all that I'm talking about can become real for you. So let me close in prayer once more. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the call of God. Let us hear it clearly. Let it resound in our heart, in our, in our ears. May we recognize what you're saying and doing and have the courage to step in whole new directions to be who you want us to be for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.